Hi, welcome to this demo and getting started video on Tidlead Settlecostin, better known as Tizik. I'm Soren Bjornstad, creator of Tidlead Settlecostin. And in fact, uh, Tizik is actually just a version of my own public Settlecostin, um, which you can find on the web at settlecostin.sorenbjornstad.com. So if you are curious about how anything in this edition is used, if you come out here and poke around, you will probably find it out here somewhere. So that can be a good additional um, resource for you as you learn to use Tiddly Tettle Costin if you decide to try it out yourself. It is expected that you know a little bit about TiddlyWiki because this is based on TiddlyWiki. In particular, this is kind of uh, alpha level software as you can see here in this big warning and disclaimer. It's not like you're going to lose any data by using this. It's very stable. TiddlyWiki is extremely stable itself, and this is just some stuff built on top of it that doesn't really have the ability to disrupt that in any way. However, uh, it's not clear that there's going to be an upgrade path to newer versions that is automated, so if I end up making big changes to this, it may be kind of difficult to switch your own system over to it. And it is just kind of expected that you're probably not going to want to keep everything in Tizik exactly the way it is, you're probably going to want to customize it, and that will require a little bit of knowledge of TiddlyWiki. There is some configurable stuff, but um, there are probably many things that are customized to my specific needs that are going to get in your way if you don't want to change them. So if you do need more information about TiddlyWiki, um, there is an online textbook I've written called Grok TiddlyWiki, which you can read for free. We can just take a look at it quickly here. Um, and I would recommend, if you're going to try to use Tizik, probably reading at least chapters 1 and 2 and doing the exercises and takeaways. Shouldn't take all that long. We'll give you a good idea of what TiddlyWiki is about and how the basic uh, functions of it work. For now, let's take a look at the documentation we have available for Tizik. Um, there is a GitHub repo here, github.com slash sobjornstad slash Tizik. And you can find uh, README and links to everything else there. Um, most of the documentation is going to be built in directly to the edition, which you download. There is also a command line interface, and uh, there's a link to the documentation here on Read the Docs. So let's talk about that CLI and how you're going to install Tzik. You have two options, as you can see here. The first is to download a single file. If you've ever used TiddlyWiki before, this will probably be very familiar. You're just going to download a copy of the very wiki that we're currently looking on at on the web here at sobrnstadgithub.io slash tzik. When we click on that, it's going to download a file to our browser's downloads folder. And when we click on it, we'll see that we now have a copy of this very same thing on our local hard drive. We can work from here and change the wiki as we like. Now, you will need a way to save this file. Um, this is kind of out of the scope of this video to talk about, but the simplest way would be simply coming to Tools and clicking Save Changes. That is just going to save a new copy of it to your Downloads folder that has all the changes that you've made. There are many, many ways that you can make saving more convenient. Um, I've put a link here uh, to view the full list of options at tillywiki.com. You would simply choose any tools that you need it to work with, say Windows, and uh, you'd see a list of all of those options. For beginners, I do recommend Tiddly Desktop, and getting that installed is covered in Grok TiddlyWiki. However, there is also another option, which is to run this through Node.js. This is something you can do with any TiddlyWiki, but with Tzik it's particularly convenient because it comes with a special command line interface called Tzik. And uh, this is going to provide you with the option to build different versions of your wiki. So for instance, I have one that is a public version that I published to the web at settlecostin.sorenbjornstad.com and also one that becomes Tzik itself, so that when I make changes to my own wiki, those changes can be easily propagated into Tzik. So if this sounds like something you would like, um, along with the ability to use Git to keep backups and version history of your old versions of your wiki, um, you can go ahead and use the command line version of Tzik. This is a little bit more technical. If you don't understand what we're doing in the next 30 seconds or so, uh, you should probably simply go with the single file option for the time being. But let's take a look at how that would work. So we are simply going to come into a location where we would like to keep our wiki and uh, install Tzik through pip. If you don't have Python or pip or um, npm or git, you'll need to install those first. And um, there are full instructions here on the read the docs page. 
um, for installing to Zeek, which will walk you through that if you need them. I run this, it's going to install the latest version, which at this time is 0.1.2. And we're going to run to Zeek in it. This is going to go ahead and install TiddlyWiki in this directory and set everything up for us. You can see that it's uh, installed some node modules through npm, put a configuration file here for the CLI called tzconfig.py, and then um, created a wiki folder, which is just the exact uh, standard Node.js tiddlywiki format with a folder of tiddlers, one uh, tiddler per file, and a tiddlywiki.info. So we can use tzik listen to tell it uh, we're ready to edit our wiki, and it's going to open up a real lightweight web server here, which we'll then be able to go to in our browser, and we'll have our settle cost in to edit. I'll go ahead and minimize that so it can keep serving in the background. And for anyone who didn't understand that, we are back to the part that you probably want to work with. So let's look at what it would actually look like to use Tzeek for something. So first, we probably want to go through this quick start wizard here. So um, having read the disclaimer, we're going to be prompted to fill in the title. And I'll use my software testing alter ego here, Alice Hacker uh, to Zeke. Um, here we demonstrate what it looks like to use. You can also add a fav icon, which is going to show up here next to the tab or in a bookmark or uh, sometimes on your system's taskbar or dock, depending on your operating system. I'll just leave it blank for now because I haven't designed a little image specifically for this purpose. Copyright, if you do want to share any part of your settle costume with others, you probably are going to want to put a copyright notice and license on it. Um, there is an option here to simply keep the terms that I use, in which case all that you need to do is fill in a copyright notice. So I'll go ahead and do that. And I'll use now YYYY so that this will automatically update to the current year. And then if we preview our copyright notice, we will see that it has saved the all rights reserved content, MIT license for system tiddlers, and that Alice Hacker's name has appeared underneath the original copyright notice. If we wanted to do something else, we would have the option to alter the notices ourselves. Then it's going to work, walk us through some basic documentation here on card types, on finding related content using the reference explorer, and keeping track of things to do. We're going to talk about all of these briefly in the video, so I will skip over them for the moment, but at some point you will probably want to go back through and read those yourself for more details. As the next steps say, we are now ready to add some notes, so let's do that. One common way that we get notes into a Zettelkasten is by taking notes on something we're reading. So I've brought up an article that I recently published on my blog, which I've chosen simply because I know the article really well, so it's going to be easy to create notes for it without having to reference things back and forth all the time. So let's take some basic notes on this. I'm going to start by copying the URL of it coming here and pasting it directly in. And then I'm going to select Import, open the new Tiddler, which is untitled, You'll see that I now have these import options here, and I can go ahead and create a source. If I were reading something that didn't have a URL, like a book, I could start by clicking the Add Source button up here, and um, I would be able to fill these in manually in a slightly less guided fashion. So that is your other option for creating a source. However, for this one, I'm going to go ahead and create, click Create Source, and it's going to ask me for whatever info I want to put in. So for the Tiddler title, I tend to use a slug in camel case. So this is going to be an abbreviated version of the title that uh, will make it easy for me to type and find in the future. So I'll go ahead and call this creating a common place. And I usually end my source slugs with the year of publication, which in this case is 2021. The source title, on the other hand, which is going to show up in this title metadata field, is going to be the full title of the source, as the source calls itself. So we'll copy how and why to create a common place, paste that in there. The author is Soren Bjornstad. Medium is an article, year is 2021. We'll say we have not read it yet. And uh, since we haven't read it, it doesn't really make sense to put in the date that we finished reading it. So we'll click import. And now we have our source here. Let's begin adding some notes. So the first thing we might want to do is just summarize what this source is actually about. So I will just write up a summary here. Article by Soren Bjornstad, 
on creating a commonplace, which is a tool for um, remembering what you've read by recording quotes, anecdotes, and other notes on your and other things you've encountered while reading or living your life. Let's say interesting fragments, because it's not just about reading. There's a little summary. Let's add, take some notes. So I'm just going to pick on two sections that we might want to take notes on here. Um, in some cases, we might want to do a closer reading where we talk about everything in it. In some cases, we might want to do even a more abbreviated reading. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to talk about um, what elements an entry in a commonplace should have and uh, what kinds of things you might want to put in one. So let's start with the elements. I'm going to just actually copy the section which discusses these and paste it in, and then I'm going to trim it down. I think that's often the easiest way when you get a information dense kind of outline to get it set up. So let's put in a heading here. We're going to call it um, what elements should be included in a commonplace entry. You can see that we get a nice little syntax highlighting here for our headings to make them easy to see where they are. We can also click the live preview button here and you're going to see exactly how it's going to look when you view it on the side. You may notice that the preview is narrower than the editor. Um, I have found that this roughly 70-30 split is just about perfect for keeping the code and the preview aligned. With the 50-50, typically the code takes up more space than the preview and so it runs way beyond it. So then when you have a really long tiddler, you end up you know, working down here and you have to scroll up to find the uh, related portion to the preview. But with this, it usually is pretty close. So I'm going to trim these out now. We're just going to say ID numbers, sources. Instead of shareability, I'm going to say whether the item can be shared with others, just to be clear that it makes sense uh, in our context in the future. This is saying the date, um, links to other entries, other related entries, and hashtags to categorize the item. Can't type while I'm on video, apparently. So there's our elements. Let's do one more of these. Let's take notes on what kinds of things go in a commonplace. And this time I'll be a, a little more detailed about it. So we'll keep some of that piece. to you, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, ideas you had. I don't know what to do with yet. Now, it might be worth mentioning that uh, this is kind of almost plagiarized. Um, since this is my own article and this is a demo, obviously I don't care about that. Um, in reality, Sometimes you might want to do this. Oftentimes you'll probably want to rewrite what you've read in your own words, um, both to be sure you don't accidentally plagiarize something and just because it makes it easier. Um, it doesn't make it easier. It is more difficult, but it tends to result in a better understanding of the material. That is up to you, uh, but the subtle cost in method generally does say that uh, it's better to do everything in paraphrase and only include quotes occasionally rather than just copying in uh, stuff that you've read like I kind of did here. Let's go ahead and click the check mark. We can see that we've created a basic entry on this source. However, there is a problem with this in that we are not actually following the Zettelkasten method at all because we've just taken the notes within information about the source. And part of Zettelkasten is that the information that you record should not depend on the source. This is because if you're doing research and we read maybe five different articles on common placing and then it's two years later and you want to find some information on the topic, you're probably not going to remember which source you should look in for that information. 
whether you're going to want to see all of the information about commonplacing organized in a manner that makes sense for that topic, regardless of where the article, um, where the information might have actually come from in what article. So let's begin uh, pulling this information out into a more permanent form. So I noticed that these two things are kind of like principles of commonplacing. So maybe let's make a section called principles of commonplacing. So we can use this excise button here or press control E to create a new tiddler or kind of like a card in settle costume terminology or etc. settle from something that we've highlighted. So this is very useful in many cases where we can just kind of take notes and then begin incrementally splitting it out into smaller pieces. So I'm going to choose excise and I'm going to say principles of commonplacing. You can see that I have an option of what to replace the text with. I'm going to go ahead and choose link here. I think that is typically what you're going to want to choose when you do this. And let's turn this into a useful sentence. So let's say um, many of the principles the author discusses are described in principles of commonplacing. If we open that up, we can see that indeed this contains all the text that we excised from it. We are going to want to give this a settle cost in card type, which is these red tags over here. Specifically, I think at the moment this is an idea. That is, it's not related to any particular source. It simply is describing some idea that you read or came up with. Now, this is probably still not as fine-grained as we would like it to be. Each of these is really a separate idea, right? There's one that's discussing what we can put in a commonplace and one that says what elements should be in each entry. So let's go ahead and just do this one more time. So I'm going to pull this and I'm going to say elements of a commonplace entry place with link and um, let's say types of commonplace entries. And then each of these will come in. These are ideas also. Oops. Now, we probably want to link these back uh, into our kind of web of ideas here. As these are, they're little tiny fragments which don't link to anything. That means that they're probably going to get lost in a sea of little cards. So let's go ahead and add some links. One very straightforward thing that we might want to do is add a source. So um, you can do this as simply as saying source and then the title of the source. There are a couple different ways we can get the title of the source. One of the simplest is obviously we can come up here and copy and paste the title. We can simplify that just a little bit by clicking this copy icon here, which is just going to copy it directly to the clipboard without us having to highlight it carefully. And then I'll paste that down there. You may notice that it automatically creates a link. This is because I have done it in this camel case squash together format, which consists of at least one capital letter, at least one lowercase letter, at least one capital letter, and then anything else as long as there are no spaces or punctuation for the rest of the title. However, you certainly may prefer not to use camel case. I like it. I find it's a concise way to generate titles. Many people hate it. If you don't like it, you're just going to put double brackets around all of your links, and then you can have as many spaces in them as you want, and it will still create links from them. Let's do the same thing down here. This time, let's use a different method. So first of all, let's describe this a little bit more uh, fully. So let's say um, Soren Bjornstad says in his article, and then I'm going to press Control L. I could also click this link button here. This is going to bring up a little autocomplete interface for it. So I'm going to say creating a common place and you can see that it showed up down there. So I can use the arrow keys to navigate to it and press enter. That a common place entry should have some of these elements. So now we've got a link back to the source for each of these. You'll notice that the author's name here is listed in italics. That means that the tiddler for it doesn't exist. Let's go ahead and create it. So we're going to come out here and we're going to add a type to it, which is going to be person, animal, or organization, PAO. And you'll see that now that we've created that tiddler, the title is no longer in italics, indicating that it is no longer missing. We don't have to put any content in the author's tiddler. I often don't. 
If we wanted to keep track of some of the information about that person, we certainly could put it in. For instance, we could say author of the technology blog, control alt backspace. I wrote a the in front of it because it's sort of an organization, and uh, that is the naming convention that I choose to use for organizations. You certainly wouldn't have to do this. You might have another equally strange naming convention. And this one's missing too. And I think it would probably be nice to have a page about the blog itself. So let's go ahead and see how that would work. I'm going to open this up. The type for this is going to be a publication. A publication is a group of sources. I'm also going to put the URL of the blog here, which is going to be control alt backspace.org. And now we're probably going to want to link this to something. Um, actually, let's give a little blurb about it too, about technology written by Soren Bjornstad. This is kind of an, an inverse of what we had in the author's title, right? And the author's text, right? But that's okay. We'll open up um, the... Sorry, we'll open up the source here, and we want to say that it is in the blog control alt backspace. On blog control. Oh, let me let me show one more way of doing autocomplete. So if you just open up a link with double square brackets, and then you start typing, and then you press control space, that will autocomplete uh, anything or, or any tiddler title. In this case, there was only one option, so it just went ahead and filled it all the way out. Uh, there were no other tiddlers that it could have been confused with, but if it was shorter um, and we press control space, it will open up this little drop down where we can either select something with the mouse or by using the arrow keys and pressing enter or continue typing to narrow it down and press tab when we're done or enter tab or enter. So you kind of have the option of that control space autocomplete um, using the link autocomplete or simply typing it out or pasting it. So there's a lot of options for easily creating those links between items. I think there's one more node that we probably should create here, and that would be a common place, which is kind of a topic. I think it should probably have its own card. So let's go ahead and create one. The easiest way to create something like this is simply to create a link to it somewhere where you want to discuss it. And then we're going to get, again, that italicized link here. So what is a common place? Well, it's an idea and um, system for keeping track of little bits of information, such as quotations or um, random thoughts, and easily managing them. We could give a much better description of a commonplace. In fact, I think I've got one on my blog that I could copy and paste if I wanted to, but this is going to be all right for now. Now, I'm probably going to want to link this to some things, right? So. Um, I'm going to link probably just to principles of commonplacing in this case. Um, so let's say many different principles useful in implementing the system are discussed in control L principles of commonplacing. There's one other thing that I could say here that I just thought of um, where we're talking about such as quotations or random thoughts. Let's improve this to say quotations, random thoughts, and then link to and others. And specifically, what we want to link to here is going to be the um, uh, types of commonplace entries. And so then we'll also, Oxford comma, we'll also have a link to many other types of things that you could put in your commonplace. This syntax here is simply saying um, make the link text and others and make it link to types of commonplace entries. You might have noticed I put my mouse up here in this little bar. This bar is just a handy way to see all of the tiddlers or cards that you currently have open. If you click on one of them, you'll jump to it. Um, if you click on another one, obviously, you'll come back. I find this very useful when I start having a bunch of things open. I can remember which things I have open and quickly hop between them. You'll see a similar view in this open tab, which is built into TiddlyWiki. But if I have another tab open, it's sometimes kind of annoying to have to go to open. Um, not to mention that if you're working on a small screen, you might have the sidebar hidden, and then you wouldn't be able to see it at all. Let's talk about these little drop-down boxes that keep showing up up here. So one is epistemic status. This is a tool that I use for um, describing how certain I am about the topic of the tiddler. 
This is handy, I find, in a settle costume because there are some things that are like, yep, I've known this for 20 years and I use it every day, but I wanted to have it in here so I could say I was confident. Or it might be, I read this idea, it's really interesting, but I don't think it's right at all, and I could say unlikely or probably wrong. In the middle is possible, which is, I read this idea, I don't really have an opinion on it, and then likely is somewhere between confident and possible. I also have the statuses down here, personal and mythological. Personal is, really, you can't evaluate it because it's just about me, and uh, it doesn't really make sense to give it a truth value. And similarly, mythological is stuff where the concept of truth value doesn't really make a whole lot of sense anyway. For instance, uh, it could be a topic discussed in fiction or a joke or something like that. Let's go ahead and give a couple of these an epistemic status. You know, I think, supposing that I am in Alice's persona, right, and I just read about commonplacing, um, this description of commonplacing is probably likely... Um, this one probably doesn't need an epistemic status because it's more of, uh, it doesn't really have any content in it. It's just a list of principles. We'll come back to that in a second, in fact. Um, types of commonplace entries. I'm going to say possible because I've only read one author talking about these, and I don't really know whether these are things that many different people would agree on. Same with this one. This one's possible. Now, we only get that drop down on ideas. We do get a different dropdown on um, sources, which is a rating. If you want to read about how I've chosen to rate uh, my media, you can look at media rating in subtlecostin.sorenbjornstad.com. You could replace this if you chose with, say, a numerical scale or something like that. I happen to like this method, which I made up. I'm going to go ahead and rate this article as average. It might be distinguished. It's probably average on my scale. If you don't want these at all, we will see in a little bit how you can use something called feature flags to make them disappear. So one more thing here, this isn't really an idea, it's more of an index. So an index doesn't contain uh, ideas of its own, it's just a way of building structure between ideas by listing out related ideas or something like that. And that is exactly what we have here, so we're going to want to tag it index. At this point, you might be wondering, okay, how do I know which of these red tags I'm supposed to use? There are quite a lot of them. As it happens, this is pretty thoroughly documented, so if you come back into getting started by going through tools, there is a section called Settle Cost in uh, Card Types right here, and uh, this is also linked directly um, up here, Documentation, Settle Cost in Card Type. And you're going to get a brief description of what each of these is. Furthermore, if you click into one of them, it's going to give you a even more complete description, including all of the fields that it has on it and what you can do with it. So if we look at a source, for instance, it's going to tell us, well, this is a single source of ideas. It could be, for instance, a blog post, a book, or a musical work. Sources may be part of publications. Like in our case, we linked it up uh, our source, um, how and why to create a common place, up to the control alt backspace, which is a publication. Um, Settle cost in card type. Uh, no, here, source. Here's the naming convention that I typically use for sources. A short camel case slug, possibly the mangle title or a description of it, plus the publication year. The actual title of the source goes in the caption field. And then sources have a lot of different fields that can be used in different tools within the Settle cost in to sort through our sources and manage references. And so uh, this is a description of what goes in each of the fields if you wish to provide that field on a source. You will see a similar treatment of each of these card types. You can quickly get to the description for a particular card type by clicking on its tag anywhere. For instance, let's do place. And then at the bottom, you'll see a list of all the places that are currently in the wiki, but at the top, you will have the option to click on place and go to the documentation on what places are. Let's close out of a few of these things because it's getting a little bit cluttered. We'll come back to just the tiddlers that we've created so far in this demo. Let's talk about the Reference Explorer. So this is the piece down here at the bottom of each tiddler. It appears as you start providing links to it. This is going to be your main tool for maneuvering your way through the wiki and figuring out how things are related. And in Settlecostin is really all about how things are related. You know, you're going to have actual information in each of the tiddlers or cards for sure, but each little card is not really very useful by itself. 
What's more useful is seeing all of the other ideas which it's related to, and that is exactly what this Reference Explorer does here. So it's going to have a number of tabs. Only the tabs that are actually relevant will appear at any given time, so you may see fewer. For instance, on this one, we can see ideas, people, sources, link, graph, and all. Down here, we're just going to see ideas, sources, link, graph, and all. And that is simply because no links have been made to or from commonplace that refer to people, whereas in creating a commonplace 2021, some have. For instance, we've linked to Mr. Soren Bjornstad. Most of these tabs are going to correspond to subtle cost and card types. As you can see, here's ideas, here's people, and here's sources. On each of these, you're going to see the title. Uh, the type link is if we link from the current tiddler creating commonplace 2021 to that item. And backlink is if the link goes the other way. So you can see that we've outbound linked to commonplace. So this one says link. Whereas you will not see any links here for elements of a commonplace entry or for types of commonplace entries. But if we move to one of them, we will see that there's a link in this one to creating a commonplace 2021. And you'll see that in the Reference Explorer for this one, there is a um, there's a forward link to the source, creating a commonplace 2021. As you might have noticed, if you hover over one of these, you're going to get a brief excerpt of the beginning of it. We can actually make that even more valuable by adding a description. So let's add a description to one of these here. Um, the description is something that you can use on any tiddler type, and it's going to be a brief summary of the topic of it. So let's say a description of elements of a commonplace entry. A commonplace entry should have at least an ID number, a source, and a shareability, and may include other useful pieces of metadata. You'll notice that this actually has some slightly more information than I put in here because these top three I considered in my original article extremely basic and required, and these is kind of optional. I often find that writing the description is actually a great way to make sure that I've covered everything in the text because oftentimes I end up with new information just like that. In fact, let's go ahead and just make this change. Critical and um, useful but optional. We could certainly expand these out. You know, we could talk more about ID numbers. We could talk more about hashtags. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and just say hashtags, because it might be useful to talk about hashtags or to see if we do a lot of research on information management everywhere where hashtags are suggested or often used. And um, let's say ID numbers, right? It's great to just leave these missing tiddlers here. They're kind of like little pegs that you might choose to attach something to in the future. You don't need to fill in information about them. They're just there. And what tends to happen is that as you use them, they may accumulate items in this Reference Explorer, even though they don't exist. So let's say that we talked about Twitter, right? So let's have Twitter. Um, this is probably going to be an idea. And uh, we'll say Twitter is a communication tool that makes heavy use of hashtags. And so if we then come to, uh, looks like I made one of them plural and the other one singular by mistake. Hang on. This is why I typically make all of mine singular. Great demonstration. So if we now look at hashtag, we'll see, oh, well, we talked about hashtags both in terms of they're a useful element of a commonplace entry and they're used on Twitter. So Having this uh, missing entry here allows us to gather together things that talk about the same topic, even without actually discussing that topic. So that can be a nice extension to the Reference Explorer in terms of hopping around your Zettelkasten. There are several different ways that we could reformat this Principles of Commonplacing if we wanted this to be a better structure building node. For instance, one thing we might choose to do is just make this into a simple bulleted list. Um, what elements should be included in a commonplace entry, and then we'll link to elements of a commonplace entry. Same thing here. Another option is we could use stretch text. So uh, this uses a uh, plugin that I've included in this wiki called uh, Tiddly Stretch. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to call the stretch macro. 
and uh, use the oops the name of the tiddler. And as you'll see, what this does is it actually pulls the description field out of it and puts it there. But then when we click the plus button, it will expand it in place to display all of the content of that tiddler. If we want to go directly to that tiddler, we can click this button here to uh, jump out to it, or we can use the edit button to directly open it for editing. You will need a description field if you want this to be useful. Um, if you say stretch for one that doesn't have it, you're just going to get this error that indicates uh, missing field description on Tiddler. Obviously, then you could simply click the edit button and add it if you so chose. Or, as I sometimes do, you might have a mix of stretch text and some other things in the same list. That's fine, too. Tiddly Stretch has a lot of other options. If you open up the stretch text in TiddlyWiki and you look at, um, where is it, Tiddly Stretch Macros, you're going to see all the options available for doing stretch text. Another thing we might like to add here is flashcards. So this is going to be a little bit outside of the scope of this video, but uh, there's an add-on included in here called Tilly Remember, which I also wrote, which allows you to sync flashcards that you include in here with the spaced repetition program Anki. So this can be a really nice way if you run across some stuff that you're like, you know what, I really want to keep this at the front of my mind, or I want to actually learn it rather than just having taken notes on it you can pull out uh, little snippets that you would like to remember. So let's just do a quick demonstration of what that would look like within TiddlyWiki. There are these two options up here for remember question answer and remember close deletion. Let's do a remember question answer. I'm gonna press Alt R, which is the keyboard shortcut. And we're gonna fill in a question and an answer. So let's say, um, maybe, what's the most common type of entry to include in a Zettelkasten? Again, this is material that's not actually in the notes, and that might lead me to go back and, and describe that, you know, quotes are probably the, the primary component of, a, of most people's commonplaces, right? A quote. You're going to see this is going to render as a little question and answer pair, and there's an ID number here. And so uh, if we then went and set up Anki, we could set it up to link to the folder or the HTML file which contains this wiki, and automatically pull all of these out and uh, add them to our collection of flashcards to study. I'm going to be doing some work on Tiddly Remember very soon, and I expect to publish a Getting Started with Tiddly Remember screencast, so uh, stay tuned for that if you're interested in this. That will go into more detail about how all that uh, part of it works. I think we've built a very nice little uh, cluster of notes on commonplacing. We would probably want to add more if we were serious about commonplacing, but uh, this is actually pretty good. Let's talk about uh, how we might choose to expand that. So I mentioned earlier that we can leave in uh, missing items and use those as kind of little pegs to decide where we want to go next. This right tab is uh, kind of directed at finding those places where you might want to expand from. One option is the missing tab. Um, the missing tab has some notes that were just kind of included in my documentation that point to things in my personal Zettelkasten. I'd like to clean that up at some point because there's lots of stuff you probably don't care about here. But you will see that, for instance, hashtag, which we intentionally created as a missing item, is included on this list. Another thing we can do is we can create a stub. So let's say we had a little more information about hashtags, but we weren't ready to actually write a full um, tiddler about it. So we can tag this stub. And when I tag things stub, I will either just leave the title as it is and think the title is enough to describe what I want to put in it, or I might write a description of what I want here. So let's say talk about um, why hashtags are called hashtags why they're useful, and um, link to different tools that use them. Let's add their history. Right. So this could be kind of more of like a to-do item uh, to research, to do further research on and write about. We also have uh, items called needing attention and needing excision. These are also yellow tags that we could apply to something. For instance, I might say that I think, you know, uh, this principles of commonplacing, this needs some arbitrary work. So I'm going to say needs attention, and then it will show up over here for me. Needs excision is very similar, except it's going to be used if 
We've just taken a bunch of raw notes in a source, and we haven't split it out into individual cards yet. That will mean that we need to go there and do that. Just like the red tags, if you click on one of these and click the button up top, it's going to give you a description of when you should use that tag. So you don't have to just remember what I just told you. To do items, if we have a more specific item that we need to do, we can use the to do mechanism. So let's see how that works. Um, for instance, right here, I was just complaining earlier that uh, we didn't really mention that quotes are probably the most important. So what we're going to do is we're going to link to to do. And we're going to write a colon, and then we're going to describe what we need to do. So mention which of these are the most frequent types of entries. And you'll see that over in the to do items list now, um, we can see exactly what we need to do and which tiddler we need to do it in. Open questions are very similar to to do items. They're, the only difference is that um, you say open question instead of to do. And the purpose of it is like, hey, here's a, an interesting research question or something I'd like to answer, but I have no idea how to answer it at the moment. So as I continue doing more research and living my life, maybe I will come up with more ideas on it. So I like to just review this periodically to see which questions I have open and whether I might have learned something I can use to apply to them. Lastly, this tray, this is actually broken right now, but hopefully I will have it fixed very soon. The purpose of this is you can drag and drop um, items either from here or from uh, anywhere where you see a link to it. And you drop them over there, and then you can kind of build up a list of tiddlers which you don't have open, but which you can quickly come to and uh, jump to. So. I use this if there are kind of larger topics that I'm working on, and I like to remind myself what things are kind of on my radar at the moment. Let's go ahead and close out of all of this for a moment, and I want to talk a little bit about additional tools for sources. So the first one is the bibliography. So this is a way of coming, uh, creating lists of sources that are related to the same topic. So let's open up our source. This is a great way to get a list of all sources. And let's create a bibliography called commonplacing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a field called bibliography. And we're going to use commonplacing as the name. This is called the bibliography key. It can be anything, but uh, it is going to show up. So it's nice to make it something that people can understand. When we save this, we can see that bibliography's commonplacing has appeared here. However, uh, that doesn't exist, so in fact the link doesn't even work because we haven't yet created the necessary metadata. Our next step is going to be to create a commonplacing bibliography tiddler. The title can be anything you want. What is important is that the bibliography field of this tiddler needs to be set to the same bibliography key as the sources you want to put on it. We're also going to give it a bibliography type. Now, when we save this, we can see that now the link to it works. It'll jump us back up there, but we're still not actually seeing a list of sources. There is a little snippet that we need to add to it. So if we open up the information on bibliographies, it's going to teach us how to do what we just did. And it's going to have a fourth step that I skipped, which is um, transcluding the bibliography list template. So I'm going to drop that in here. And now we're going to see that the sources have started showing up. For the curious, if you're less familiar with TiddlyWiki, um, these double braces are a transclude which means take the content of this tiddler and display it right here within this other tiddler. Whereas the little uh, pipe pipe there is called a template transclusion. So what this is doing is it's passing through the information of the current tiddler to that other tiddler. So in this case, that means that it's going to be able to access this bibliography key. And so the template uh, bibliography list will know which bibliography it should display a list for. You'll probably notice also that there's an empty bullet point here. That is because we are meant to fill in the description field when we include something on a bibliography in order to describe what the source is about and why we might want it on a bibliography. So let's do that. Um, let's say article by Soren Bjornstad discussing how he has done commonplacing for the last 10 years. And now it's updated there. Of course, in most cases, a bibliography will contain more than one source. A source can also be in multiple bibliographies. You would just add a space and more bibliography keys there. 
that is kind of how that works. It's going to give us a nice little bit of metadata about the publication date and the type and a link to the full text if we do have a URL field there. Another thing we can use with sources is the reading inbox. That's this icon up here. The purpose of this is to keep track of sources which you have not yet read. As you can see, uh, currently it thinks we haven't read how and why to create a commonplace. We actually have, so we should probably change it to read. But I'm going to leave it like this for just a second while we talk about the rest of it, because when I choose read, it's going to disappear from the inbox, because the inbox is just things that we haven't read yet. We can set it to partial if we wish, which means we're still working on it. If we set it to partial, it will float to the top of this table. Typically, you're going to, of course, have more than one item in your reading inbox if you've been adding sources ahead of actually getting to read them. But um, right now, we just have the one. We do have this option for postpone. The purpose of this is if the reading inbox starts getting really full, we can choose to have it disappear for a time and then come back so that we don't get overwhelmed. This is nicer than deleting it in many cases because you might still find it useful in the future, but um, you might not want to see it in the meantime. So if we say, for instance, even later, it's gonna disappear. We'll see this little expo postpone box on here. We'll see that it has a way to, it will show up again on the 7th of October. We can bump it even later if we want, just by clicking it a few times. As the name suggests, this is exponential, so after six bumps, it's now not going to show up again until 2051. At some point, it's probably going to be older than us if we keep doing that, and then it will be kind of like we soft deleted it. I can bring it back in immediately by saying now if I wish. Shout out to Andy Matushak here for uh, coming up with this idea. This is still a very rough prototype, and I don't know how well it works in the long run. It seems to be working pretty well for me, I think, right now. Um, but this is that part is kind of an experiment. When I'm done reading it, I can choose red, and it will be gone. There are a couple more tools available to you as a user of Tzeek. If we click on this tools icon up here, there's some documentation, uh, the central custom card type, which I pointed out earlier. Um, naming conventions, these are quite detailed, and they're the ones that I have chosen to use. They're probably not the ones that you want to use, so you are encouraged to come in here and edit these naming conventions as you decide what you want to use. And then you'll have a nice reference to your own naming conventions customized for your use. Configuration, you can come back to getting started. You can look at feature flags. Um, I forgot to show those earlier when I was going to. I'll come back to them in just a second. Um, some information on builds and what you want to show up in the public edition if you create one. And then uh, some various types of aggregators and general maintenance tools. So you can explore these when you have the time. So feature flags as this says right here, allow elements of the wiki to be selectively enabled and disabled. So let's suppose that we didn't want to see the media rating on sources, right? Let's go ahead and open up our source again. Um, the rating up here shows up in this little uh, box here with a dropdown on any tiller that is tagged source. So let's um, disable the media rating in private and in public because if we never set it in private we probably don't want it to show up in public as you can see it is just magically gone we can bring it back just as quickly by checking the box again there it is we can also choose to have things appear only in public for instance this is the default for the copyright footer um, if we check private we can see that this is going to display a little brief copyright notice with a link to the full one we probably don't need that cluttering it up in our private version because we already know who owns it, but um, we can show it if we want to see it temporarily. Similarly, we might want things to appear only in private. For instance, this nice little top bar here is definitely not standard for TiddlyWiki and might confuse some people, so I don't have it visible in public, but if we wanted to have it appear in the public edition too, we could click that box. You can add your own items to feature flags if you want things to appear only in private or public or you just want to be able to toggle them on and off quickly. There's a brief description of how to do this right there. I think that's everything that I wanted to show within Tzeek. If you have any questions, um, feel free to post comments here or email me, cetelkostin at sorenbjornstad.com. 
I can't guarantee support for this version because it is kind of alpha, but uh, if you're curious about something or you think you found a glitch, I'm sure there are a lot of glitches and bugs in this version because it's the first one that I've published like this. Uh, please go ahead and let me know and I'll see what I can do for you. I do want to show briefly the Tazik command line interface in more details. So if you did go with a Node.js version and you want to be able to publish a copy of only part of your wiki, this is the part for you. So let's actually open a new uh, one entirely here. We're going to go into my wiki. And let's take a look at this tzconfig.py. So this is going to give us information on committing, listening, and most importantly for our purposes, building. So the way that public wikis work is they're going to extract just a subset of tiddlers from your wiki. So there's a default public export filter here. Um, this is going to include anything that's a system tiddler, because without system tiddlers, the wiki's not going to work, as well as anything that's been tagged public. And then there are a few exceptions that uh, are mostly system tiddlers that uh, you, we don't need to make public, for instance, temporary tiddlers. We're going to use that filter down here in this section called products public. So we can define as many different uh, build outputs as we want. So for instance, in my own Zettelkasten, I have one that's my public Zettelkasten and one that creates Tzik itself so that it always stays up to date with what I'm doing in my current wiki. In your default configuration, you are just going to have an option for a single public wiki. It's going to export all tiddlers that match that filter. Um, perform a replacement of any people's names with their initials if they are marked as private. And it's going to go ahead and set up some values here. This is basically just altering the visibility of different buttons. But if there's anything in your own wiki that you wish to change specific tiddlers to specific values as you build a public wiki, you can do that. It's going to check for kill phrases. The purpose of this is just an extra a degree of certainty about not accidentally publishing something private. So there's an option in our tools for kill phrases. Basically, I can say I don't want, you know, uh, blue cheese to ever show up in my public wiki. And so if we then accidentally published a tiddler that contained the words blue cheese, it would fail at this point before it published anything and let us know that we accidentally made something public that contained blue cheese. And then finally, it is going to create an, uh, a single HTML file for us, which then we'll be able to upload to any location that can host static files. So let's see how this works. Let's run a uh, to Zeek build public. Public is the name of that product that we defined um, within the configuration. And we're going to have an error here, which is strange because I was positive that I had fixed this. <laughs> I, I must have just mixed something up somewhere here. Um, that's really annoying. I'm just going to delete this stage for now. Sorry about that. I'll make sure that I get it fixed before you uh, work on it here. We can see that it's now successfully copied our output to um, a folder called wiki output public site. And if we look in there, we're going to see that we have a folder of externalized images just to in decrease load times for somebody who's opening this file. We don't want to have uh, hundreds of images embedded in this single HTML file and then have somebody have to download to a 200 megabyte file before they can start seeing it. If we open this, um, let's actually open it in Chromium because that's the browser I'm using. We'll see this is indeed Alice Hacker's Tzik. Um, it's a little bit simplified. There's no save button. There are no, there's no control panel button up here. There's only two tabs in the sidebar and so on. But by and large, it's roughly the same thing. Um, we also have a f uh, tiddler called public homepage. This is not a very enlightening public homepage, but you can alter this tiddler in your wiki to um, give people an introduction to your public Zettelkasten. You'll also notice that because we had that public feature flag on, uh, this copyright notice appears in the footer. Now, there's not actually anything useful in here because we haven't indicated that we want to publish any tiddlers. So let's try actually publishing a couple of tiddlers that we wrote recently. Let's take our source, creating a common place. We're going to say publish this tiddler. Checking this box is just going to create this or add this public tag to the tiddler. And let's also, let's take all of our ideas directly related to that and let's make all of them public too. 
publish, publish, um, publish. We can also do this while we're editing. The publish box comes up here, and you'll see that there's a little thing indicating whether you're editing a private or a public tiddler just to, um, if you're writing and wonder if you can say something super secret in it, uh, you can look up there to see quickly. Let's do a rebuild. To Zeek build public. I'm gonna rebuild that. I'm gonna refresh the output here. And when we come into recent, we will now see that all these tiddlers have appeared publicly. You can also see how this uh, private person replacement worked right here, right? So um, it was Mr. Soren Bjornstad, but the Mr. Soren Bjornstad tiller didn't have the public checkbox checked. So it went through and found everywhere where we linked to that person and replaced it with just the initials. This is handy if you have uh, if you want to talk about your friends and you don't really want to create a bunch of entries in Google in your Zettelkasten where you're discussing them. Um, you know, you might not have anything very private and unflattering displayed in the tiddlers that merely link to them, but it's probably good manners not to create a bunch of uh, entries that are really irrelevant to anyone out in Google. One more thing you can do with um, public and private entries is if you have something that's mostly public, but you want to keep some part of it private. For instance, let's see that we talked about blue cheese in here, right? Which was something that we said we really didn't want to publish. We could pull this out into what is called a private chunk. So the button is right next to X size here, or it's Control Shift E. If I press that, boom, it's going to uh, actually extract it into another tiddler for us called um, the title of this tiddler slash P. And we're going to see that there's this little bar here indicating this is the portion which is private and it's the text blue cheese. So it's still going to appear right within this tiddler. If we wanted to edit it, we can open the private and edit the piece here. And what's going to happen when we publish it, let's do that, is when we open the types of commonplace entries, tiddler, we're not going to see anything in the output. If we were to edit it, we would see that we did try to transclude a private chunk, but because the chunk itself is not present in this HTML file, there's no way to see what is actually inside of it. If the title gave something away or the existence of a private chunk gave something away, this might be a problem, but that is probably pretty rare. So just running this build public obviously doesn't publish anything, but you do have this uh, HTML file in this folder, which you could copy uh, to whatever hosting service you want, for instance, GitHub Pages or uh, any other static web hosting service. If you wish, you can even edit your Tzik config to automatically publish it. So in your Tzik config, uh, there is a builder available for GitHub Pages or you can uh, create one yourself with shell commands or something like that, which will cover um, actually pushing and publishing it to that location. So if we look at our getting started, um, there is a page of documentation. Here we go. Uh, whoa. <laughs> there is a page of documentation on read the docs which describes the Tzik command line interface. And there's a whole page of builders, which are these little executable chunks that perform different steps in the build process. And there's an option here called publish wiki to GitHub. So if you wish to take advantage of this, you would just uh, add a new builders.publish wiki to GitHub step, including any information that was needed to make that publish. Thank you for watching this video on Tzik, and um, if you've decided you want to try playing with it, hope you enjoy it.